Welcome to the 35th annual MLK Day celebration here in Greensboro. We're glad you could join us. My name is Doug Bender, chair of the newly named Human Rights Commission. I wanna say thank you, first of all, to the committee members who have worked so tirelessly to put this together. They've done a remarkable job given the limitations that the pan pandemic has presented us with. Our theme this year is women in the movement. Whether they were working on the front lines or behind the scenes, women have always played a critical role in the civil rights movement, no matter where you think of. Often not receiving due credit for their work because our goal is to recognize the heroines of the civil rights movement. It is by intentional design that I'll be the only male participant in the program this year. From nationally known leaders like Kamala Harris to locally known leaders like Katie Dorsett, whether we recognize you by name or in spirit, whether you paved the way for others 50 years ago or you're working tirelessly today, we acknowledge you, women in the movement. We have so much to be thankful for and to look forward to. While we are equal under the law, we're still not treated equally. We do not have equal access. We still struggle for equal opportunity. That said, there is a new energy, a new hope, a new faith, and a new passion in our beloved community to move the needle of progress so that we can realize the dream of Dr. King. We just all need to continue working together, moving in the same direction with the aim of positive change. First, it is customary for us to sing, lift every voice and sing, and this year is no different. Please join me in welcoming Cynthia Green with her moving rendition. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. So need the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast god of our weary years god of our silent tears thou who has brought us thus far on the way thou who has by thy might led us into the light 
keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. As you can tell, I'm taping this greeting. And as you know, things change quickly. Recently, we saw the first shipments of the COVID vaccine transit to facilities around the country. That gives me hope that we will soon be able to gather together in events like this was meant to be. I miss the fellowship and being able to remember the remarkable man, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the legacy he left behind. Today, we are recognizing and acknowledging women in the movement. Coretta Scott King was MLK's wife, but she was also a visible face in the civil rights movement. She was an American author, activist, and civil rights leader. An advocate for African American equality, she was a leader in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Mrs. King continued to play a prominent role in the years after her husband's assassination. She led the struggle for racial equality and became active in what was called the women's movement. Mrs. King founded the King Center and sought to make her husband's birthday a national holiday. She finally succeeded when Ronald Reagan signed legislation which established Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And that's what brings us here today. She later broadened her scope to include both advocacy for LGBTQ rights and opposition to apartheid. Mrs. King became friends with many elected officials. Her telephone conversation with John F. Kennedy during the 1960 presidential election has been credited by historians for mobilizing African American voters. After she succeeded in getting Martin Luther King Jr. Day made a federal holiday, King said her husband's dream was for people of all religions, all socioeconomic levels, and all cultures to create a world community free from violence, poverty, racism, and war, so that they could live together in what he called the beloved community, or his world house concept. Many of us will remember a young voice of a nine-year-old girl during the 2018 March for Our Lives in Washington, DC, the granddaughter of Martin and Coretta, Yolanda Renee King. My grandfather had a dream that his four children will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character, she told the massive crowd in Washington. I have a dream that enough is enough, she said. This should be a gun-free world, period. Then she led the massive crowd in a chant, cheering, spread the word, have you heard, all across the nation, we are going to be a great generation. She has continued to speak about civil rights issues since that day. The Kings have left the world in good hands. We have our own heroes and sheroes right here in our community. My friend, Mayor Yvonne Johnson, is the only African American mayor in our history. She tirelessly works for the people in our community and it stands apart in so many ways. She was there February 1, 1960, 
joining the call for equality about desegregating the Woolworths lunch counter. It was about more than a lunch counter, just like it was more than a water fountain. Yvonne was joined by her friend, Claudette Burroughs White, and the women of Bennett College and UNCG. Yvonne is a proud Bennett Bell and Aggie. And as Congresswoman and former city council member and school board member, Alma Adams likes to say, Bennett Bells are voting bells. Our Ruth Wicker Memorial for Women in Barber Park pays tribute to the strong women in our history. One of those women is Shirley Fry. Shirley has dedicated her life to raising her family and lifting up the city of Greensboro, supporting her husband, Justice Henry Fry, but standing solidly as her own woman. Shirley has left her mark on our city. She always answers the call for her time and her talents, and we are a better city because of her. The room would be full today, full of women who have led the way, full of women whose shoulders we are standing on, and full of women who are fighting in the trenches today, young women who know that the struggle isn't over, not in Greensboro, not in North Carolina, and not in these United States. Women have always put in the work, raising families and raising awareness and raising our moral compass. Please enjoy today's programs. Let's celebrate the strong women among us and lift up those women in need. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to wear a mask, practice physical distance, not emotional distance. And like our mamas told us growing up, wash your hands often. Thank you for your time and enjoy today. Lullaby, baby, for my lullaby boy. Life's still well, mama made more magic. Bedtime, baby, pull the bunny out my bonnet. I'll sing the softest sonnet. When the rain comes, you will find us where scraped elbows meet soft kisses. Nutmeg meets cinnamon, and the rest of the ingredients are my mama's secrets. If you listen, the song that plays when there's no music to mix is mother's heartbeat, half stepping in your head, woman thou art loose. Interpretation of art, the start of foundation does come from your hips. Women have always been a part of this movement, breaking their backs to build boys into men that will sing their praises. The work is thankless, you ask for comfort, love. I give you all that I can muster up. You say the boys are out. I tell you Alva Bell before they tag you, but it's hard to ask for help, isn't it? To admit you need a woman's input that her insight is something dangerous. Dangerous enough to dare a man to share a dream she'd be swept in, and it's funny, cause y'all think I'm talking about Coretta. She will find us close enough to hear our blueprints, but beg a boy to bring them forth. What is it about a woman that has y'all scared? Is it because she is both stern, sassy, didn't I tell you, and equally, baby, I did this so you wouldn't hurt yourself? The way she can make a dollar from 15 cents or a mountain to a molehill with the God that she spits, sits, watch over her babies, and makes medicine with her kiss, cooks meals for masses with her five loaves and two fish revolutionize the way we paint our vision. Woman sounds a lot like wisdom when you think about it because without her who could birth these great men, there will be no epitaph of names, no eulogy of the past. We are and have always been the twinkle in the eye, the straightening of the spine, mother of beginnings, the love on the front line, seen and unseen but never unheard from. Like a whisper in the wind itself, we are the movement, the melanin, the muse, the reason and the rapture. 
beginning boycotts, integrating schools, and sacrificing our bodies and churches for at a time how we still defy in death. Martyrs and mothers. Lullaby, baby, for my lullaby, boy. Lie still while mama make more magic. You will find us where scraped elbows meet soft kisses. Nutmeg meets cinnamon and the rest of the ingredients are secrets. If you listen, we are the song that plays when there's no music. Only heartbeats. We don't have step. We are the foundation and freedom. We have always been a part of this movement. The blueprint. Write the vision and make it plain, but leave it to a woman to use a paintbrush. Woven into the present from a persistent past, a representation of generations yet to come, we fight, pray, sing, march, mend, remind of a woman's way to birth magic from ashes. Bedtime, baby, pull the bunny out my bonnet. I'll sing a softer sonnet. When the rain comes, we are the movement. Hi, my name is Yvonne Khan. I'm chair of the Greensboro Youth Council and senior at Northern Capote High School. I'm also your event MC this morning. Thank you again to Cynthia Green with the, and the Gate City Youth Slam team for your inspiring performances. This annual event is a memorial to the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let's take this opportunity to consider his vision for a unified nation. Please join me now in a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. We know that faith was important to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was known as an interfaith visionary, striving for unity across lines of faith, saying that the force of love was a supreme unifying principle of life. I'd like to introduce Reverend Julie Peoples with Congregational UCC Greensboro, Rabbi Rebecca Ben Gideon with B'nai Shalom Day School, and Yefa Ali with the Islamic Center of the Triad. Claudette Colvin, Diane Nash, Polly Murray. There are so many leaders of the movement whom many of us do not know. Now is the time. Now is the time to get to know them. Now is the time to follow in their footsteps. Now is the time for the faith community to become full partners in the struggle for freedom rather than the arch defenders of the status quo as Dr. King implored the faith community to do so long ago. It is time. And with the help of God, and with the spirit of those powerful, fierce, courageous, beautiful women, we can together make justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. As a Muslim hijabi, my hijab empowers me, but to others, it can appear oppressive. To me, it symbolizes my strength, my religious agency, and my modesty. To others, it can be an uncomfortable practice. As a Muslim woman, I share the same dream and sentiments as Dr. King did, to tackle inequality and injustice and to celebrate our differences. I pray that we continue having healthy conversations on our differences, continuing to empower women and people of color by addressing the uncomfortable and making it comfortable, and by purifying bias and prejudice through compassion and acceptance. Ten days before his assassination, Dr. Martin Luther King addressed a group of very lucky rabbis. And these rabbis greeted him by singing, We Shall Overcome in Hebrew. His friend, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, he introduced him, and here's what he said. He said, where in America today can we hear a voice like the voice of the prophets of Israel? God has sent Martin, Martin Luther King to us. God has sent Martin Luther King to us. And he has a voice, he has a vision, and he has a way. Dr. King then delivered a stirring address. He said, however difficult it is, however shocking it is, we must face up to the fact that America is a racist country. Unfortunately, those words resonate to this day. And today, we're inspired by his voice. We're inspired by his vision. And today is a day of hope, 
of resolve and of recommitment to taking personal responsibility to walking further down the path that was Dr. King's way. So in his memory, let us all say, Anu Nitzka Ber, we shall overcome. Anima Amin Be'amuna Shlema, I believe with perfect faith. Anu Nitzka Ber, Ba'od Hayom, we shall overcome someday. You're probably familiar with the ANT4, the four young men who started the sit-in movement. We applaud their courage and tenacity, but there were many among the four. Young women from Bennett College and UNCG, formerly known as Women's College, who showed equal courage and tenacity in the face of hatred and hardship. And women today who are working tirelessly to advance civil rights. In keeping with our theme, we want to show you a video featuring the women in the movement, a video entitled, I Am the Four. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. I was there when Dr. Martin Luther King came to Bennett College. The civil rights movement of today is an extension of the civil rights movement that, be that began after slavery. I am a proud 1961 graduate of Bennett College for which I, my sisters were a vital part in the planning and implementation of the sit-in movement. And that's one thing I can say about Bennett College during that time, during the students were committed uh, to making a change and seeing a change. Bennett College fostered within us the desire and the strength to express ourselves, but to be able to back up whatever our ideas and thoughts were so that we could fully implement what we were about to do. The Bennett Bells were, um, I, I would say, the, the foundation of uh, what happened because um, they sustained the movement for a long period of time. It wasn't so much of making the decision. When the opportunity came, I, we were just there. We knew we were sp supposed to be there. We knew we wanted to be there. We knew we had to be there. So it wasn't a matter of making a decision, it was a matter of doing. We know that the work that we did and with their involvement had an impact on the world and that we are all grateful for. When you give the best of yourself, your talents, your gifts, um, it always comes back to you triple fold in some way and you touch the lives and you change sometimes the lives of people whose lives need to be changed. I was voted the most valuable player, first black female to be voted the most valuable player for the Sidley women's softball. I don't consider myself as the front line for, but I do consider myself as breaking barriers. Uh, along uh, athletic lines and then being women of color we encountered uh, things that went against the grain. I've noticed that being a black woman in America is very um, intimidating to most people that I worked with in corporate America but also too in social, social settings. Um, it has also created a bit of a conversation piece for others uh, as in to discuss like my qualifications for certain roles. One challenge that I face um, because of my identity as a black woman in leadership um, is sometimes having men or different people in power question. Um, my role and my position. Being a woman of color, often feeling like I was pushed to the side, my voice wasn't heard or I didn't matter, but um, that just gave me more reason to fight. That gave me more reason to come forward and say, you're gonna hear me, you're gonna see me, you're gonna know who I am. And it just gave me more drive to stand strong, head up, chest out, and say, I am woman, hear me war. To be a woman, to be able to have form, to have femininity, 
to be able to carry the Eve gene, to be able to be of color is something to be proud of. The work that I've done, I've enjoyed all of it. You know, it's hard at times, but I've been very grateful and thankful for the support I've received from people, from um, the ability to feel like I'm making a difference at 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, I definitely feel like the spirit of the ANT4 is absolutely with me every day, every voter registration drive, every political event. Um, I feel them pushing me and moving me forward. I do feel like I've kind of jumped on the front line to say let's stand together, let's fight together, let our voice be heard for those who are afraid to speak. We want to be a voice for the voiceless. So we do want to fight, you know, we do want to go forward and when people are being taken advantage of, we want to be an advocate for those who don't know how to advocate for those, themselves, for the children in school who need to have educational equity. So I am proud to say I am one of the four. I think that the younger generation should be opinionated and outspoken because one has to be heard. In this lifetime, I've been fortunate to carry on the torch. This is a marathon. And the energy and strength that I share with others that people see with me, these are my ancestors, these are my family members, these are my, my sisters, my moms, my aunts, all around me pushing me to you know, go forward. Pick something that they feel passionate about and really get involved in that and work to make the difference they want to see made. That's what I would say to young people. Because um, when we work together, there's very little we can't do. Our voice matters, our concern matters, and when you're gonna hear us, you're gonna feel us, and you're gonna know that our concerns are your concerns. We have to keep fighting uh, to, until this country decides to um, accept us as fully equal, and, um, and, and you know, we don't know exactly when that will be. I know we're moving in that direction, and that trajectory is encouraging, but yes, we need Black Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter is ex the extension of what I was doing or have been doing in some ways all my life. And what I hope continues to happen is a disturbance of just raw feminine energy. Like, I'm so excited to say that I think even my generation will be the one that breaks the mold for that. Founder and CEO of Duftable LLC, Zidi Zumalo, or Dr. Z as you may know her, was born in Swaziland, Southern Africa, and has lived in Queensboro since she was four years old. Dr. Z earned her BS in Business Management from Guilford College, her Master's in Communication Studies from UNCG, and her PhD in Leadership Studies from North Carolina A&T. In 2016, Dr. Z was recognized as one of the Triad Business Journal's 40 Leaders Under 40. She has facilitated emotional intelligence workshops for the Salisbury Police Department, authentic leadership workshops for universities, nonprofit organizations, and faith-based institutions, and is an adjunct coach with the Center for Creative Leadership. Dr. Z is also one of the four founders of We the People International, a Greensboro-based nonprofit organization focused on activating youth and young adults through education and entertainment for year-round civic engagement, community work, and entrepreneurship. A dancer and lover of the arts, Dr. Z is also a freelance writer and has been featured in several publications, including O. Henry Magazine, Triad City Beat, Black Business Inc. Magazine, and Huffington Post. She has also authored speeches, op-eds, and research-based web content on a variety of topics, including leadership, spirituality, and culture. A longtime active resident of Greensboro, Shirley Fry earned her BS in English and Education from North Carolina A&T and her Master's in Special Education from Syracuse University. Shirley's experience in special education and media and her dedication to community and service has earned her a long list of awards and recognitions, including the North Carolina A&T Alumni Achievement Award, NCCJ Humanitarian Award, National Council of Negro Women Woman of the Year Award, and Greater Federation of Women's Club Women of Achievement. She has served with the International Civil Rights Center and Museum Management Committee, Greater Greensboro United Way Board of Directors, Hospice and Palliative Care of Greensboro, Greensboro Interfaith Council, Breeding Connections, and the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce. Other affiliations include Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, 100 Black Women, Women and Ministries in Higher Education, NAACP, and the International Women's Connection. 
Join me now to hear Shirley and Zidi talk about their dedication to civic engagement, how it's changed through the years, and the roles of women in civil rights. Welcome to the 2021 MLK Memorial event. It is my honor and pleasure to be able to be seated here with Mrs. Shirley Fry. How are you today? I'm wonderful and it's great to see you again and to be here. And I still haven't learned how to pronounce your last name. So I'm gonna call you Zitty if that's okay. That's okay. Right. And I've, I've gotten permission already to call you Shirley. Is that Well, correct? you didn't have to have permission, but that's, that's <laughs> fine. That's We're in fine. the South. We're in the South, so you know. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's good to be here, especially in talking about the Martin Luther King celebration. Yes, yeah, and so we're, we're here today because we get to have a conversation about the role of women in civil rights, right? Um, first question that I have for you, I'm uh, a millennial, I'm a cusper, I guess, I'm a part millennial, sometimes I'm a Gen Xer. What would you say are the similarities and differences between when you were younger and what was going on around activism and civil rights and what's going on right now? Well, women's roles at that particular time was partially at home. Uh, case in point, I'm not gonna ask you what year you were born, but I'm gonna ask you, when did you graduate from college? What year? Well, that's a trick question. I'll tell you the year I was born, I don't mind. It was 81. But it I have the PhD now, but it actually took me nine years to finish my four-year degree. But you were born in 1981. That's right. You want to know when I was born? Yes, ma'am. 1931. Oh, wow. Okay. So at that time, uh, women's roles was probably at home. And, and first of all, I was born on a farm. Yeah. And so there is quite a bit of difference between a person born on a farm and a person born in an urban area. Yeah. Um, Wait a minute, I'm processing the fact, you're 50 years older than I am? That is correct. Good grief, you look fabulous. Well, the first thing is <laughs> when, when, you, when you talk to me and you say, we're in the South and we have to do that, that is not necessary. So that is age differences. Okay. Uh, rather than, you know, where you are. Yeah. Uh, more often than not. Okay. And what environment that you're in at that particular time. Yeah. So, so you grew up on a farm um, what was going on in the world during the time when you were coming up, your 20s, 30s? Well, you know, I think I'd lived, we, I was lived, I was in a protective kind of environment where my parents were what I would call fundamentalist. And so there were certain things that we could not do, certain things we could, places we got, could not go, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And at that time, if someone referred to my mother, they would say, Mrs. Uh, Ed Lindsay Taylor, okay. never calling her name. And the same thing happened up until uh, I, uh, I got married and I, was, I got married in 1956. Wow. Uh, if you go back and see, and I look at my mail now, my mail came as Mrs. Henry E. Fry. Yeah. And each time someone would speak to me and I said, my mother named me Shirley. Yeah. And so there, there was a period where you were changing those kinds of, of roles. Yeah. Because in 1959, that was still before you were born, right? It was. Okay. Yeah. My husband graduated from law school. Yeah. And one of the things he said to me on the way back from graduation was, Shirley, I appreciate so much your helping me get through law school because he used his GI. And we were married and I was paying the bills because I was teaching at that particular time. Mm. And his response to me was, now you don't have to work. Mm. And I said, Henry doesn't work that way. I have something to share with other people. And I think it would be unfair for me to hold what I have. And when you come home from work, I don't want to sit around and talk to you about that the washing machine broke. Yeah. I want to talk about what happened in the environment. And yeah. he respected that. From the beginning, he respected it. From the very beginning. Wow. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I did not use Mrs. Henry E. Fry. Yeah. I signed my name Shirley Fry. Yeah. But everybody else would respond to you as Mrs. Henry E. Fry. And that's what would have happened to you. Yeah. And I think the now is people your age, I call are instant people. What does that mean? Because if you look at communications today, 
something that happened on the other side of the world, you could get it in 15 minutes. Mm. And that's how you grew up. Yeah. When I grew up, it would take a week or so to find out what happened on the other side of the world. Yeah. And so I think that young people your age now have to have something instantly. My question to you is, yes, what differences do you see now as when you grew up? Did you grow up in an urban area? Well, so I'm originally from the African South. So my mom is South African. She grew up farming, very rural area. Well, I've been to South Africa three times. Have you? Have, yes. Yeah, well, welcome home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my dad is from Swaziland, and that's where I was born, a neighboring country. And so from the age of four, I've been in Greensboro. And so a lot of what I've seen coming up has been in relation to what's been going on in Greensboro. And I do definitely see a difference in the way that people relate to each other. You know, I graduated from high school in 99. So when I was in high school, I went to Dudley High School. Um, we, you know, it was a big deal when our friends got a pager. I didn't get a cell phone until I was in my 20s. And so I've seen the shift from even in a classroom environment, people talking to each other before class um, to now I'm a teacher myself. The kids are all looking at their phones. You know what I mean? Um, I've seen a difference in the way that people relate on an interpersonal level. Uh, and that's hard for me because I'm a very touchy-feely, you know, face-to-face -face kind of a person. So I've had to make adjustments with how social media works. And I've had to learn how to fall in love with it. Well, guess what? Yeah. I had to get adjusted to the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> because we did not have cell phones. Yeah. Uh, social media was, was, was not there. Uh, because when cell phones first came out, I would not let my grandchildren come to the table with a cell phone mm. because I wanted direct communication with them. Mm. Because in order to develop effective relationships with people, you have to have direct dialogue. Mm -hmm. And looking down at a cell phone is not going to help you because if you go to restaurants now, and I do it all the time, I go to restaurants and I see, I look around and say, look at those people over there. Both of them are looking at the cell phone. Why are you going to dinner mm -hmm. together if you're going to look at the cell phone? Yeah. yeah. But we're here to talk about civil women's well, it's roles. All, you know, okay. Yeah, it's all connected, though. <laughs> it's all connected, though. So. Yeah. Oh, I will say this. The other difference that I've seen is, you know, in relation to the role of women. Do you feel this shift that's happening now with women really wanting to take ownership of ourselves and ownership of our lives and our futures? I think that women in my generation even view things um, like leadership differently, like speaking publicly differently. There's just a different kind of energy around the confidence that women are allowed to have, so to speak, uh, when it comes to leadership? I've never felt that women were allowed to do. Mm. But first of all, I think you have to have confidence in yourself yeah. and feel that you are worth something. Mm. And you don't have to be allowed uh, to do something. Have you always believed that about yourself? I have. Really? I have. A lot of us well, don't. Well, part of it is, I think, I do believe in birth order. Yeah. I am the third of five children. Oh, wow. And, We're five also. And the middle child has to rough around and say, I'm here. Wow, yeah. You know, when many times the younger, uh, younger one is always recognized. The oldest one is always there. But I was that child to say, here I am. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, but I think if you develop confidence in yourself, then you can move because you, if you don't have confidence in yourself, do you have confidence in other people? Yeah. Or you allow them to take over. Anything that happens to you is because you allow it to happen. Yeah. Because if I had, I can't say allowed, my husband to say that I'm gonna stay at home, I, I'd been home I'd be home right now. Yeah, and we know a lot of women who are. That as, and, but that's yeah. what they are comfortable with. Not all of them, Ms. Fry. Oh. Shirley, forgive me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not all of them. I think that a lot of women are taught to pretend to be okay in those kinds of circumstances. Uh, but part of the reason why I enjoy having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people is because people will disclose a different kind of reality when, when they're able to really be vulnerable. So for me, you know, I'm 39 and I've never been married. I don't have any children. 
And there are a lot of people in my generation who might think that there's something awry about that, you know, because there is kind of still an expectation, you know, to have partnership by a particular time, you know. Well, I have to be a grandmother. Yes, ma'am. And I have a granddaughter that's 34. Yeah. I have one that's 32 mm. and one that's 30. Mm. The 32-year-old one is married. The 34 and the 31 is not even concerned about yeah. what they're doing. They're, 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 they're in pro their professions mm -hmm. and in enjoying what they do. Mm -hmm. And the one that's married is, is enjoying also. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because they have developed confidence in themselves mm -hmm. and are comfortable with, with that. And it may be the environment in which you're a part of mm -hmm. that that allows you to feel comfortable that way. Yeah. I don't know. I, first of all, I'm not an expert, and I remember that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a person in your life who has been your mentor and that has helped you along the way? I've had several different ones. I've had several different ones. I haven't. Um, there are a few, like a small handful that I can say have been around for a series of years. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've moved around a lot in terms of jobs and professions. And yeah, I've had different kinds of mentors. Not enough consistency in the way that I would want. Well, you know, I, I look at people that I call mentors like that. It's almost like a philosophy of life. Mm -hmm. You pick one here, one there, and another, and then you develop your own. Yeah. Because that's what I've had. First of all, has been my mother. Yeah, I would agree. Definitely my mom as well. She is one of the most uh, hardworking women I've ever encountered. She also has like this relentless joy where, you know, sometimes, yeah, it just, it's a mystery, you know, how, how she's able to conjure up so much joy in such difficult times. But I have a lot of respect for that. I also recently watched the um, RBG, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary. So that was fascinating. The Princess Diana documentary, fascinating. Um, and then I read Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. She's definitely a heroine as well. But I just, I, yeah, I like women who, who define themselves for themselves much like you've done. So, yeah. Well, I often say that I hope my behavior is never one that I have to apologize for. Mm. And, and I work hard at that. Yeah. Uh, I work hard at trying to, to also make my sons and my grandchildren proud of what I do. Yeah. All right, I've got another question for okay. you. Um, the Greensboro Four, you know, everyone all over the world, uh, many people know the story um, of Greensboro and the Civil Rights Movement and the Greensboro Four. Um, what many of us have come to learn is that behind those four men who are, you know, the faces of the movement, there were quite a lot of women in the background. Um, can you tell me a little bit about who you were and what your role was during that time and then what your thoughts are about women and, and maybe the absence of visibility during movements like those? Well, the women were not absent during that movement. Uh, it was the the four young men who decided that that's what they were going to do. And women from Bennett, UNCG, A&T, and all came along and supported each of them because I knew each one of those. When the sit-ins, I was pregnant with our second son oh, wow. at that particular time, which means that I have never I shouldn't say never, but I was not an active participant. I was behind the scene participants. Mm -hmm. And I think you need people who are comfortable out marching. You need people who are in the background negotiating mm -hmm. with, with what is going on. And also people who are going to work to provide the financial background that a person has. And I was not an active marcher. So women had a role, and uh, a very supportive role, but because they were not out there all the time like they were, doesn't mean that the women were not supportive. Yeah. Do you feel that the, did those women who did play the behind the scenes roles, did they feel um, recognized or acknowledged for their role in everything? I don't think it's really necessary 
to be recognized for everything uh, that you do, uh, then I, you know, I have this feeling that, are you doing it because you want somebody to know that you did it? That's a good question. Or did you do it from your heart? Yeah. And, and that's my basic feeling. Yeah. Let me say now, has there been an extraordinary challenge in your life that you had to solve? Yeah, uh, all the time, it seems like. <laughs> no, can't be all the time. A lot. I mean. No, you wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> if you had all those kinds of challenges all of the time. I feel like, okay. I, so being an immigrant, that was a, a significant challenge because coming from the African continent to the American South, th there was, you know, I was made fun of by the white kids and the black kids because of the misunderstanding about. And that's what they call bullying now. Bullying, okay. that's right. That's right. So I was, you know, bullied in different ways as a result of that. And I think now one of my challenges is, you know, my oh, I'm, I cry too, you know what I mean? And I don't have, um, I've got to figure out ways to kind of discipline myself in that and figure out how to solve problems. And um, well, before you go any further, yes, ma'am. I cry when I'm happy, and I cry Me when I'm too. sad. If you don't <laughs> even believe, now, you cry a lot. Even to this point, I um, I was talking to my oldest granddaughter, who happens to be in Colorado Springs, yeah. and she was talking about some experience, and it was one that she was pleased about, you know, and everything. And she was sharing with me how she responded, and I'm like, oh, oh I'm so <laughs> pleased. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I guess in a couple of words, it's the managing my emotions through everything. I never really intended to be an activist. It happened on accident at the beginning of the summer. WFMY contacted me. At the time, I was working in the School of Health and Human Sciences at UNCG, and they contacted me to talk about allyship and how people could be more effective allies. And then the headline of that story was local activist talks about allyship. So that's how I kind of got thrust into that activist space. Um, but I think, you know, managing my emotions and all of it, because like you, I've, I marched for the first time in Graham, North Carolina this summer on July 11th. And I remember, you know, we were walking in, in a big mass together. And when we turned the corner, there were people there with Confederate flags, yelling all sorts of things. And I've just never had that feeling before. I have not seen it up close like that before. And they were just saying all kinds of vile things about us um, because many of us were black. Um, but like you, I don't necessarily see myself as someone who will use marching as part of what my own strategy is. I feel like I can be more effective somewhere else. Um, but it's managing my emotions in all of it. Because I fall in love with everybody. I care about everything. Um, and I know that's something that has stretched me, you know, quite thin, just trying to have my hand in too many things at the same time. So I've just got to figure out how to, you know, focus all that energy that I have to, to be able to calm myself in the work that I'm doing. Why do you think there's something wrong with that? Maybe there isn't. I mean, I, I, I just ask the question. Well, I, I'm, I'm going through the kind of confidence and self-acceptance that you have. I'm going through this process of getting there myself. I've been subject to critique from a lot of different areas over the course who, of my Who life. hasn't? Yeah, you're right. Especially if you go public with anything. Yeah. And it's your interpretation of how people respond to you. Mm -hmm. Case in point. News people, if you do anything, they call you an activist. Right. <laughs> but I know that I'm not an activist. Mm. But if you look at some of the, the clippings or something, they say Shirley Fry an activist. Yeah. But it's, th it's their interpretation of an activist. And you don't have to take that on. Yeah. Well, how would you define yourself then, if not an activist? A behind the scene person. Oh, really? And, and, and I love working behind the scenes. I love to make other people look good. Yeah. Is it important for women to have leadership positions? I think so. Why? Absolutely. Huh. I mean, from the different experiences that I've had, there's a difference in mindset in many ways. And I know, you know, I don't want to make a generalization. I know that people are different. But I think that because of the things that 
women have experienced within our culture uh, and the fights that women have had to go through within our culture, there's just a different kind of observational skill that a lot of women possess. There's a different kind of emotional intelligence and, a, and an ability to connect that is characteristic to a lot of women. I just think that there's a lot that any underdog in general can offer to now, an who organization. Who are you calling an underdog? Well, I mean, this is this is it, you know. What is it? Who's the underdog? In many ways, based on the way that the culture portrays things, women are among a group that's set up as an underdog. And I'm not saying that that is who we are. I'm saying that we live within a culture that separates people in different ways. And in American culture, there is, in many ways, a separation between The woman, and woman. is the top dog. Well, not do the you underdog. Believe, does everybody believe that? I don't know, but that's what if, Shirley but, believes. But 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 let me put it <laughs> let me put it this way. Okay. Okay. Women more often than not are better managers than men. But are they are there more women managers than men? Wait, a minute, let me tell you what the kind of manager I'm talking about first. Okay. 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 I, I have to take myself as an example. Okay. I had to manage my household. Mm -hmm. I had to manage two sons to get off to school, to go to college, to go to work. Mm -hmm. I had to manage preparing meals for each one of them. And then when I go outside of the home, I can help manage something else. You ha if you're not the manager, you have to learn to manage your boss. I have done that a million times. Mm -hmm. But I don't look at women as underdogs in any way. Well, but what about wealth disparities, wealth gaps? That's a real I thing. mean, it's there, Gender but you work gaps? hard. You, you can work to remove that. Have we, though? No, we haven't got there. I right. mean, and, 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 and nothing happens overnight. It takes us to work bit by bit. So you mentioned earlier that you don't consider yourself an activist. Let me ask you this. How would you define the word activist? I tend to define an activist, those persons who go out in the field and march and wave signs and things of that kind. That's what, how I refer to an activist. Because I have not done that or choose not to do that, but to work behind the scene to, and, I, and you need all of us. Mm -hmm. You need those people out there. I always say you need somebody to stir the pot. Yeah. And you need somebody to solve the pot. Right. And they're not necessarily the same. Right. And I believe in people doing what they are more comfortable doing. Right. And that's how I, I, I define activism. Yeah. And so the movement, um, if I understand you correctly, the movement itself has some who are activists who are kind of the faces and the pot stirrers. What would you call the people who are behind the scenes and having the conversations to make change and work on the policy? positive reinforcers? <laughs> the positive reinforcers. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I had to define myself when I, I looked up like the definition of activist, and it's, you know, actively engaged in the community. I definitely see myself as that. I've always been really involved, whether through volunteerism or organizations and things like that. Um, positive reinforcer, I see myself as that also, you know, I, I agree with And there's with nothing you. wrong with that. Yeah. There's, there's not a yeah. thing wrong with that. That's how I define myself. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I, I define it is because I have other responsibilities. Right. Oftentimes, when I see that activist out there, that's 90% of what that person does. Mm. But I see myself of dividing it all up. Um, I see myself mixing the dough and then rolling it in, into whatever you want to make it after that. Mm. Because um, there are several roles that, I, that one has to play because I had to, to be a wife first, yeah. and then I had to be a mother, and then I got to be a grandmother, and I have to be a worker. I have to support whatever I do, mm -hmm. and also support my husband, what he chooses to do. Mm -hmm. 
So what advice would you give for the younger generation of women? Is that do what you choose to do and do it well. If you choose to marry, and marriage is not 50-50, it's 100%, 100%, you'll lose some and you'll gain some. <laughs> and it's not, it, I, I look at that kind of thing like you do a wedding band. There's no beginning and no ending. You have to continue working on it in order to meet with success. You know, case in point, I made the decision to support my husband in whatever he chose to do. Mm -hmm. I, there's one thing that I had planned to do that I did not do, and that was get my PhD degree. Mm -hmm. And I said, it, I don't have to have a PhD to do what I want to do. Yeah. And so I have done practically everything that I chose to do being married because I had the support of my husband. Yeah. And it's because you made the decision that we were going to work together so that he would be happy and that I would be happy and at the same time rear some normal children. Yeah. Yeah. Is there in, any advice that you have for young people or any advice for me that I could respond to young people who ask me that same question. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I definitely feel like times are changing. Uh, there's a shift that's happening. The, the ways and the rules that may have uh, been the basis for how the world and the nation operates, I just really feel like they're changing. And so the advice that I would give to, to women who are younger than me is to just pay attention, you know, pay attention to what's going on around you, pay attention to who you are and what your strengths are. Um, I, I, you know, for better or worse, I didn't have um, as much of the, the confidence that I feel like I am growing into now as an adult. And so with the younger girls especially, I just encourage them to really to step into that, to, to be exactly who it is that they are um, because, you know, the past didn't necessarily allow for that. You know, there were definitely roles laid out for, for many of us along the way. And so I see a lot of people breaking out of that. And so for, for women like yourself, uh, Miss Shirley, you know, the intergenerational gap, I really feel like is something that we have an opportunity to bridge. When you talked about, you know, the uh, civil rights movement back in the day, the older folks having a difficult time working with the younger. I really hope to see a shift in that. Like I want us to be able to learn from the stories of our elders so that we can have wisdom, you know, with the energy that we're moving today. So um, I, I just hope that we're able to, to work together more. Well, I think, I think that is happening. Yeah. Uh, case in point, I've told you, you know, how old I am. And people tease me all the time because they never see me having lunch with somebody my age. <laughs> and I told them that I don't deal with old people. <laughs> Last question. Are you pleased that your parents brought you to America? That's a great question. I am. I am um, and I am connecting more to the collectivist culture that is more African than it is American. So yes, I'm very, very glad uh, because there have been an incredible amount of opportunities that I've had in America. I also consider myself a global citizen and so I enjoy having a level of comfort in different places. And I will say that there's a, a collectivism, a unified spirit that we experienced more back home than we have stateside. And so I feel like part of my own purpose is to bring some of that Ubuntu, the collectivist energy into leadership and, and human rights work. Yeah. But since we're here with Martin Luther King's celebration, I am so pleased that Martin Luther King came about mm. because he was the person who taught us how to be nonviolent. Mm and how to hear things and allow them to brush it off and then work to 
to make things right. A and go back to John Lewis, he says, and get in good trouble. Yeah. And I have to say that it is certainly marvelous and wonderful to have had this conversation with you and to find out that you are a great lady and that you are an asset to this community and to America as well. Thank you. Likewise, it's an honor. I was like giddy when I got the, the email, like, oh, I get to talk to Mrs. Fry. So it's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, and thank you again for being a part of this year's Martin Luther King Jr. commemoration. Clearly, we're in a different time, definitely in a different place, but it doesn't change the legacy of Dr. King. This year's theme, Women of the Movement, is critical. It's important to think about the role that everyone played when it comes to the evolution of civil rights in this community and around the world. Of all the women, we have to be careful to remember Dr. Coretta Scott King, who not only stood by his side, but held her breath in angst, knowing that she was a part of a family that simply stated was a moving target in the name of doing what was right. I believe that the spirit of Dr. Coretta Scott King trickled down to every person across America, knowing that the courage to stand behind this man, to stand behind this team of individuals who would push the needle forward would call for a level of courage unprecedented, and nonetheless, they stood. We have women right here in this community who have indeed stood and continue to stand for what is right on behalf of human rights. On today, let us all embrace that same courage, that same tenacity, that same strength, and that same will. Regardless of being man or woman, we know what it takes to do what is right. I'm very grateful today for this celebration. I'm very grateful as the Director of Human Rights to be the support mechanism for this community-driven event. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the team, the Human Rights Department, for the role that they play in making this happen, specifically Jody Stanley, who is our Education and Outreach Coordinator, and Marion Davis who works tirelessly to coordinate every contract and make sure that everyone here is present and accounted for on a day like today. Certainly, it is important to be very, very much so thankful of the people who participated in making this event what it has been, virtually or not. And so I'm grateful to our city's leadership, Mayor Vaughn, for her participation. I'm also thankful for the MC who worked tirelessly to perfect her engagement opportunities with you all to make sure that this was really warm and inviting, but also very professional. And under these circumstances, that takes a lot. So hats off to our youth for being that committed. I would also like to take the time to thank every performer, every person who contributed to the artistic display for today's event. And of course, I want to thank Dr. Smalo, as well as Shirley Fry for all of their tireless preparation and for making this a lively and engaging event. Certainly, we want to thank the Human Rights Commission, who never ever considers it a tiring, labor intensive commitment, but really a joy to be the spearhead of this event. And I certainly want to thank every community member who participated in the MLK Planning Committee to make sure that this event, regardless of the change in our times, was successful. Please help us to make this event what it needs to be every single year by filling out your evaluation. We need to hear from you so that we can make this celebration everything that it should be every single year. Thank you to the city of Greensboro and all of its leadership by way of the city council for always supporting our ability to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you. Our senses restored, never to be the same.
whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be. Be and be better. For they existed. Countless dedicated, courageous women were key organizers, activists, and champions in the fight for civil rights. Without these women, the struggle for equality would have never been waged. Thank you, unsung heroines of Greensboro. Today and every day, we honor you. Mountain top.